Hi everyone, I'm Adam Chalmers, and for the last five years I've been writing web, server, backends, and Rust. People usually think of Rust as that super fast language, but I've actually been using it in domains where speed is not the most important thing. So why use Rust then? Because I've actually really enjoyed the reliability and correctness guarantees that it gives me. A little bit about me, I'm from Sydney, Australia, and I've moved to Austin, Texas a few years ago. I really like teaching programming. I was a tutor at my university. I've tutored high school students in programming. And now that I'm kind of a professional, I like to teach Rust at work to my coworkers and also on my blog. I really like learning new programming languages. I like to find the best parts of each language and bring them with me when I start writing code in a new language. And I think the designers behind Rust probably had the same feeling because Rust seems to have a lot of my favorite features from other programming languages. So these days, I mostly write Rust. I used to work at Cloudflare, where I made security products for five years. Now I work at KittyCAD, a little startup that's making CAD software, which doesn't suck. I started building Rust backends when I was at Cloudflare. A little background, Cloudflare is a reverse proxy. It's a CDN, a DNS server, a DDoS mitigation, it's a firewall. It's a lot. It's very versatile. But these are all very, very latency-sensitive operations. So they run on every single request to your website, usually. So it's really important that they don't add latency to all the people trying to view your website. Because of this, Cloudflare operates a lot of data centers around the world, really, really close to where your users are. Uh, and they try to write a lot of their software at the time in C++ to keep the, memory, to keep the latency down. Then in 2017, they had a pretty bad bug called CloudBleed, where a buffer overflow meant they leaked secret data from their customers to visitors of the websites. It was pretty bad. So Cloudflare decided to rewrite everything in memory-safe languages. At the time, that mostly meant Go. In 2018, I joined Cloudflare, and I was put in a new team with a new product. And as a new product, we were more concerned with correctness than latency. Customers can tolerate a little latency here and there, but if they can't actually use the product and their customers can't log into the website and access their bank accounts, people tend to get pretty mad about that. So correctness, really important. And because of this, we had a lot of best practices to make sure that our software was stable. We developed these best practices, but we found that they had to be constantly present in our head. We had to always be thinking about them and be very disciplined in our code. And that was really not the team philosophy. The team philosophy was we should use tooling and systematic solutions so that we didn't have to be superhuman. Even the best programmer slips up, right? So at that time, when I joined, people were experimenting with Rust as a way to, write, to make really, really, really performance software, again, to keep latency down. But our team, more concerned with performance, uh, more concerned with correctness than performance, we wanted to experiment with Rust to get its stronger type system and things like the borrow checker, because we thought they'd help us get some of these best practices out of our head and into the compiler, where the compiler could check them for us. So we decided to start small and write some monitoring software in Rust and then work our way up to a backend. We'd all kind of experimented with Rust before in our hobby projects, but we'd never actually used it in production. So it's really important to start with these smaller projects and get used to things like async Rust and how to package and deploy Rust. I now work at KittyCAD and we use Rust for very different reasons. The big one is interop with other languages. We're building a computer-aided design suite, CAD suite, and we have a graphics engine that renders your 3D designs in the cloud. It's written in C++ because C++ has the most mature Vulkan graphics libraries. C++ is definitely the right tool for that job. But we did not want to write the API that controls that graphics engine in C++. Because remember how 30 seconds ago I was just talking about cloud bleed and massive memory leaks, uh, buffer overflows? Yeah, wasn't going to let that happen again. So. We decided that the graphics engine would be controlled by an API written in Rust. And this worked out pretty well because it's much more ergonomic to write an API server in Rust, as you'll see soon. But Rust actually links really nicely with C++ code. There's a crate called CXX, which lets you really easily interoperate Rust code and C++ code. The CAD suite front end runs in the browser. And generally, that means you're writing a lot of JavaScript. But we actually reuse our Rust backend libraries on the front end by compiling them to WebAssembly. And this lets us share API schemas and type definitions between all of our code bases. Now, KittyCAD's revenue comes from charging for API usage. So it's really important that customers can actually use our API as easily as possible. So we ship API clients in Rust, Go, TypeScript, and Python. Now, at previous jobs, keeping the API schemas and the docs and the server implementations and the client implementations all in sync with each other 
was a really time consuming, error prone, chore, a lot of labor. But at KittyCAD, we use a library called Dropshot, which is a library for writing servers. It's actually made by a folks Dockside computer who you may have heard speaking earlier today. This library lets you automatically generate open API schemas from your code that defines your servers. So you know the schemas are always accurate. They actually describe what's happening on the server. Then we take those machine generated schemas and we can generate API clients from them. So this way, by using code generation, we ensure that the API docs, the server and the client are all kept in sync. None of this manual fussing around trying to make sure that we replay the same changes across all these different code bases. This means all of our API clients are up to date and we don't require repetitive toil from engineers to make this work. This is a big theme of my Rust usage. We can use code generation to reduce manual labor from engineers and reduce boilerplate, which means reducing typos and the burden number of lines you have to review in PRs and the possibility of things going wrong. So to recap, I often hear engineers say you should only use Rust when you can't afford garbage collection pauses. But I'd actually really disagree with this. You think of, uh, people often think of Rust as a really low level language, but I think Rust can actually be a great high level programming language for focusing on correctness and stability guarantees, for getting your domain logic correct. It can be a great high level programming language for backends. Uh, so at these companies I've worked at, that's why I use Rust not for performance critical code, but for correctness critical code. I will say there is definitely a learning curve with Rust, but you're kind of in luck if you're trying to write a backend in Rust because there actually happens to be a really good book called Zero to Production in Rust, written specifically about how to write backends in Rust. So I recommend that for uh, training your employees a lot because the learning curve can be really difficult, but it's getting easier all the time. So let's talk a bit about why I chose Rust for these projects. Reliability is the main reason. I find Rust code to be more reliable than the alternatives. And this is because Rust just doesn't crash as often because it forces you to handle potential crashes upfront when you're writing your code. You can turn them into compile time errors when other languages will make them into runtime errors. So there's no nulls, which means no null pointer exceptions or it's weird cousin undefined is not a function errors. It's resultant option types make error handling these cases pretty easily. Generally, you just use the question mark operator. If you're used to checking nil manually, like if foo is equal to nil, return nil in other languages, you can just put a question mark at the end, kind of like Swift code, and just handle the error by propagating it upwards to the caller. Uh, I know I said this talk isn't really about performance, but performance and reliability do have an important overlap, which is that if your code is too unperformant, it becomes a reliability problem. If your code is too slow, you're going to start timing out and requests are going to start getting failed. And from the, use, the user's perspective, a timed out request and a request to a backend that's down are indistinguishable. So performance problems can become reliability problems. So building a backend on a very performant language can actually help you quite a lot with reliability. I find it much easier to write correct code in Rust. Enums are a big part of this. They let me model my domain correctly. I can say users either have a monthly subscription fee or a lifetime account ID, not both, not neither, exactly one of them. And the compiler can verify that only one of them can occur, only one set of fields at a time. This massively reduces the amount of error handling code you have to write and the amount of defensive coding practices you have to use. No more littering your code with assertions like assert this thing is not null with a little comment saying this should never actually happen. The compiler can prove which errors can't occur. I really like functional programming. I think functional programming has a lot of power to reduce the number of bugs that you have. But if I'm being honest, functional programming can be a huge pain in the ass sometimes. I find that 80% of your code is really easy to write in a functional way, and that last 20% is really complicated. I've never shipped code to prod in a purely functional language, and I really like Rust because I can easily write that 80% in a functional style with immutable variables and using, you know, filter, map, reduce instead of a for loop. But for that last annoying 20% that's really hard to write in functional code, you can just drop down to writing imperative code. You can just open up a file, assign it to a mutable variable, and push some bytes into it. Problem solved. You don't have to go and read a whole category theory textbook to figure out how to do IO in an immutable way. Rust's tooling also really helps me keep best practices in software and make the tools enforce it, which means I don't have to think about it as hard when I'm reviewing PRs. The Rust compiler and its official linter at Clippy can help you spot a bunch of correctness and performance problems. This minimizes the number of things I have to check myself. 
Cargo Audit is a vulnerability scanner which checks if your dependency tree has crates with known vulnerabilities or if their dependencies have crates with known vulnerabilities and so on. And Cargo Deny lets you add even more analysis to your project, like banning certain versions of certain crates. There's a lot of tooling work being done in Rust right now to add even more advanced lints. There was a whole little session about it at RustConf. So I think this is only going to get more and more powerful with time. Lastly, Rust's macros are really powerful. Later in the talk, I'm going to show you some examples of how macros can help you keep your JSON schemas and SQL schemas in sync with the rest of your code base. But I already talked about how macros let me keep my API server implementation in sync with my API server spec, which lets me generate clients. So macros can lead to some kind of code that's a bit difficult to debug. But when used carefully and judiciously, using libraries ideally maintained by other people who really know what they're doing, macros can replace handwritten human code or handwritten boilerplate with a lot of potential for typos and off by one errors and copy paste errors with nice, neat, performant code. It's kind of like a list macro. A Rust macro is basically a program that takes in Rust source code and emits other Rust source code. So they can really reduce the amount of bugs in your program when used carefully. And we're going to see some examples of this. The two examples I like to talk about are JSON and SQL. And Okay, let's be honest. Backend people, it's just you and me right now. Most of writing backends is just gluing JSON and SQL together. That's the truth. We don't like to talk about it, but it's true. My philosophy is if your backend is mostly just gluing JSON and SQL together, you should be really fucking great at gluing JSON and SQL together, right? So Rust has two libraries that I think are best in class for JSON and SQL and they're powered by macros. So I want to show you how they lead to better, correct, more correct code. Uh, Certe is a phenomenal library for deserializing requests and serializing responses, really getting data into and out of your program. The Cloudflare tunnel backend that I worked on would have occasional bugs with JSON handling. Usually, they were nothing show-stopping, but we did have one bug where actually we, I disconnected every single tunnel in the world because it wasn't clear. Uh, wasn't clear coordination between a server and client, whether a null array was the same thing as an empty array. This is the kind of thing that a strong type system can prevent. <laughs> These bugs are often caused because Go relies on programmers to write by hand the JSON name for every field. This leads to typos and requires a lot of careful unit testing. On the other hand, in Rust, we can use Certe, which provides macros to automatically annotate all your fields with code generation. So you don't have to manually write typo-free, uh, typo-prone code. Here's an example. The top struct is in Go, and the bottom struct is in Rust. At the top, the Go struct can be converted to and from JSON. Notice that we have to manually write each field's corresponding JSON field name in camel case here. Uh, on the other hand, the equivalent Rust code uses Certe to automatically rename every field with camel case instead. This really reduces the chance of writing a typo, which again reduces the amount of unit tests you have to write and saves you time, making it more productive. Now, both structs skip serializing the my name field if it's empty. In the Go case, we have this omit empty annotation. But Go only lets you skip the field if its length is 0. That's how it knows that it's empty. In Certa, you can pass any string method or any handwritten method or function uh, to, to determine whether you want to omit this field. And this is really helpful because not all Go fields can be omitted. Not all Go fields have an empty value. For example, structs don't have an empty value. What if you want to omit a struct? Well, you've got to make it a pointer to a struct. And what is the empty value for a pointer? It's null. So you better be really careful not to unwrap that null. Otherwise, you'll get that null pointer exception again. My Go back in the Cloudflare had problems with SQL as well, in a very similar way. You're constantly passing around SQL column names and trying to make sure that your Go structs line up with your SQL schemas. This is called the dual schema problem. How do you keep your programming language's model of a database in sync with the SQL database's actual model of itself? This is the dual schema problem, and it's kind of annoying, and it requires a lot of manual unit testing and very much uh, very careful testing around migrations in particular. So Rust has a really great library called Diesel. It's a very powerful library that solves this dual schema problem by generating the SQL in your Rust for you. Diesel's CLI tool reads your database migrations like these. You write these by hand. And then Diesel can automatically translate it into a Rust schema. See this Diesel table macro? This is generated by the Diesel CLI tool. So this macro encodes your database schema in Rust. 
Now that your schema is in Rust, when you try to write a uh, code that needs to interact with SQL, like a Rust object that, or Rust value that corresponds to an SQL value, the compiler can check that these two are, in conform are conforming to each other. See how it's got these uh, table name is for posts. So now Diesel can analyze your statements and make sure they're correct. For example, if I comment out the published field here, you can see that my post type no longer compiles, right? It, see, uh, it sees that the Rust code is still referencing this phantom schema field in the corresponding struct. And even the queries themselves will give you a very similar error, right? The queries that refer to this published field can no longer work. So these bugs, these prevent real world bugs without relying on manual testing. The last aspect of Rust correctness is the borrow checker. People usually talk about how the borrow checker prevents buffer overflows and use after freeze, you know, memory bugs, but you can use it to enforce a lot of high level invariants. So when I was working Cloudflare Tunnel, we were adding a client that had to make four connections to Cloudflare and it had 10 IPs it could choose from. My goal was to make sure that no two connections shared an IP. Otherwise, if the IP went down, they would both go down, defeating the whole point of having this highly available redundant system. So how do you test this? How do you make sure that no two connections are sharing an IP address? It took a lot of manual testing because if you pass an IP by value, it gets copied. And now there are two parts of your code that are reading the same IP address. On the other hand, if you pass by reference, there are two parts of your code that have a reference to the same IP address, so it can still be read. And Rust borrow checker can actually be leveraged to solve this problem. So you can enforce that uh, the IP is never copied by value. I've made a new type called unique IP, which wraps an inner IP address. And because it does not implement the clone trait, Rust will not let you copy this. I've tried to here, but it tells you you cannot copy this. There's no clone method. So this locks down pass by value copies. On the other hand, uh, what about passing by reference? In Rust, there are two kinds of references. There's normal immutable references and there's mutable references. They kind of work like an RW mutex where you can have one writing reference or many reading references, but you cannot mix them. So all you need to do is make sure that using an IP address requires a mutable reference. You can only have one mutable reference at any time to a particular value. So we can see here, we cannot use the same IP twice you get a second mutable borrow and that's not allowed. So we've proven that you cannot use the IP twice, whether you're passing by value or by reference. So this is why I tend to think that Rust can actually be a great high level language for writing backends. It's very reliable because it's type system and enums force you to handle errors at design and compiling time, writing code. So you are less surprised at runtime. It does really great libraries for JSON and SQL, which let's be honest, is a lot of what writing a backend is about. And these are enabled by Rust's macro system, which lets you generate code to make sure that you are not writing boilerplate by hand, which means fewer typos and fewer you need for unit tests. You can also enforce high-level variant, uh, invariants, like how often a resource is being used. And Rust can interoperate with the really high performance parts of your system, like C++, and even the front end by compiling code to WASM and calling it from JavaScript. Thank you so much for listening. I've been writing Rust backends for five years, and clearly I love to talk about them. So if you ever want to talk more, you can find all my contact details on adamchalmers.com, where I also tend to blog about programming. Have a great rest of the conference, everyone.